one guy and somebody else is standing up here. Others of you, I told you this morning, I warned you, I said you probably wouldn't be happy with me later today. This is the time, okay, because you heard me this morning and now you're going to hear me again. So I apologize for all of that. Um, so Brother Ryan had some schedule changes that required uh, some assistance in the Sunday school class. So great news is come back next week, you get both Brother Ryan uh, in Sunday school and growth groups, and then you get Brother Sonny um, as he opens up a new series next week. So let's move on. This church... Uh, this church, this is where Brother Sonny took us the last time he spoke to us on July 2nd. Um, and so what I want to do just to kind of bring you up to speed is give you what I call the Scott notes from that, <laughs> all right? So these are my notes that I looked at when I was getting ready to, to speak today. I just went back and said, well, where did Brother Sonny leave us when he last talked to us? Because I always think that's a great place for me to be thinking about. So I pulled out my notebook and I went through them. So what you're getting is not necessarily what Brother Sonny said. It's just what I wrote down in my book. Okay, so you can take that or leave it. Um, and if you heard something different, that's okay. Um, this is what I heard, okay? These are my notes. Okay, knowing our purpose, come on, there it is. Knowing our purpose as a church is useless. That's what I wrote down. Then I realized there was a next line. <laughs> Knowing our purpose as a church is useless if we're unwilling to follow the process God has outlined for us. Does that sound about like something he said? All right, good. So I was in the right sermon. Um, so our purpose, our purpose as a church, um, what is it? Well, he clarified it for us pretty quickly. Um, he said it was this, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go, make disciples, baptize, and teach them. Amen. That's what our purpose is as a church. Okay? Now, individually, we have different purposes sometimes. But collectively, as a church, this is our purpose. This is what God said we were to do when he left. Okay? He said, hey, let's all go up to this hill. I want to talk to you a minute. Okay? And what he said is, I've got all authority. The warrant's been handed to me by God the Father, and I'm now passing it to you. And I give you the authorization to go, make disciples, baptize, and teach them. Brother Sonny then took us through the prescribed process. He'd be happy that I got two Ps in a row, so I hope he'll listen to this. I didn't get three, I couldn't figure out how to get three in there, um, but I did get two. So the prescribed process, Acts 2, 41 through 42 says this, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. So again, this is what my note said that Brother Sonny told us the prescribed process was. Gather together consistently for encouraging and equipping as our motivation to go out and serve others enthusiastically with unconditional love. And you know that Brother Sonny said that because there's just so many long words in there. Okay? That is definitely something he would say. Okay? So gather together consistently for encouraging and equipping as our motivation to go out and serve others enthusiastically with unconditional love. He told us a short version, which I like better. Gather, scatter, and I added repeat. Gather, scatter, repeat. Gather, scatter, repeat. Gather, scatter, repeat. So this morning, let's talk about this church and you. This church and you. Because see, this church is just a group of baptized believers who have come together and said, we want to work together and do what God has called us to do in this place. Okay? So it's made up of lots of yous, lots of individuals. So where are you? Do you believe? You remember what Peter said? That Peter spoke, they believed, they were baptized, and they were added. A real concise three-step process of how we move from being a non-believer, an unbeliever, not a part of God's family, to being a part of God's family, to proclaiming him as our Savior, to joining a local New Testament church. Right? There it is in three steps. How do I get into the church? That's it. That's it. Okay? Um, 
So where are you? Do you believe? Have you been baptized? Have you been added to the church? Well, for sake of argument, since I've only got so many minutes, let's assume that the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Now what? Now what? Now, I know the answer isn't yes, yes, and yes for everybody. I get that. But let's assume for a minute you fit into that category where the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Now what? How about here? Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Somebody find Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 in their Bible. Many of you could do that. I'm not just saying one of you should do that. I'm saying many of you should do that. But one of you in particular should do it so I can hear you say it out loud for everybody else. And I can't think of anybody better than Sister Debbie back there. All right? Where are you at? I mean, I know you're right there, but what verse are you in? I'm so sorry. That's all right. I look, I look and you know what? Because, you know, I went, well, maybe I put the wrong verse up there. Because <laughs> I've, I've done that before. So go ahead. He gave, he gave some apostles and some prophets yes. and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect Thank you. That's why that's not up on the screen. It was just so long. It got to be about a nine-point font, and I figured you couldn't, probably couldn't see it anyways. So let me give you the condensed version of that. Again, my thoughts. So Christ gave pastors to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. Okay? So Christ gave pastors. It said so. Christ gave apostles and pastors and teachers, and it gave them for what purpose? Well, again, we don't have to guess. This is one of those great verses. We don't have to wonder, why do we have pastors? Who really needs them anyways? Okay, we sometimes think about that. I'm part of sure. I know I have. Why do I need this guy? What's he doing for me? Okay, that's usually when I'm out of sync with something, when I ask those questions, but nonetheless, we ask them. Christ gave those pastors to equip God's people, us, to do his work, not a pastor's work, his work, okay? God's work, to do his work and to build up the church. That's a big word we call edifying. That's where we get our word edifice, right? A nice tall thing that's reaching up word. That's the idea here, that we're built up. And by the way, I love the parenthetical, the body of Christ. Okay, because that's in the Bible, the body of Christ. So, how long do we got to do this? I thought this was interesting because the verse actually says until... Until, until what? That means there's, there can be an end, maybe. We only have to do this for so long. Until what? Well, here we go. Until we consistently attain unity in the faith and knowledge of Christ, a standing as high as Christ himself, stability in biblical understanding, loving and truthful speech, maturity under Christ our head who makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each one does his own work. So you want to get going to church? Find a church that is pretty close to doing all those things and has them all right. And then pretty soon, you'll be done. So how long will that take? How long will it take for us to consistently attain these things? Unity in the faith and knowledge of Christ and standing as high as Christ and biblical understanding that is steadfast and loving and truthful speech and maturity under Christ our head as a part of the whole body who fits together. How long will that take? A day? A week? A lifetime. A lifetime. 
So this then is a lifelong journey, right? This isn't a, well, I go and I got, so I'm good. It doesn't work that way. Because God says that the process is I gave you a pastor to help equip you and build you up. And how long do you need him? You need him until all those things. And the moment all of us can check all those boxes, we're here. And if I was looking at the list, I'm pretty sure none of us can check all those boxes. So then this lifelong journey. Our pastor has been placed here by Christ himself to lead, guide, and direct us that are part of this church body. As our pastor slash shepherd, he is charged with guiding us from one pasture to the next. Because this is a journey. See, we're sheep, right? The Bible kind of says we're sheep. Not, a, not my favorite animal to be likened with. I prefer like a lion, maybe even an elephant, something. I don't know, something. But a sheep, no. But I didn't get to pick. God picked. He said, the best way I can describe you guys is you're a sheep. Okay? And what's the most important thing about sheep? Yeah, all those things you said. <laughs> Which means they need a shepherd. They're really going to thrive. If they're really going to grow. If they're going to do the things they're supposed to do, which is make more sheep. That's what they do. Um, they need somebody to watch out for them. They need somebody guard, guiding them from one pasture to the next. And you notice, I, I was thinking about Brother Danny as I was reading these verses and, and thinking about this thought, um, who used to share with us since he spent time on um, Brother Dottie's husband, who's already now talking to Missy, um, has upon time shared with us about what it means to be a, a shepherd and how sheep act. And we learned so much from that um, experience with him that it reminded me that he used to tell us that the shepherd could always had to be moving the sheep because the sheep would sit there and eat the, in the pasture um, until there was no food left. Right. And then they would sit there and stare at each other. <laughs> like, well, now what? Now what? what? What do we do now? And they would sit there. Our pastor's job is to know what, now what, before now what comes, right? Following God's lead when it's time for us to move on from one pasture to the next or to the next. And if you're paying attention, Pastor Sonny has been telling us it's time to move to the next pasture. If you're paying attention, Brother Sonny has been telling us it's time to move on. Shifting focus, doing something new going to a new pasture, taking the next step, growing. How do you feel about that? Yeah. Like, yeah, let's get on board. Let's go right now. Ready. I'm ready. Let's go. Right. I know it's difficult <coughs> because I know how long Brother Sonny has been telling us it's time to move on. It's been about six months. It's been about six months that he's been trying to redirect our focus and reshift our attention to a different place. And that's tough because sheep just love staying where they're at. Never mind that there's no food. Never mind that there's no sustenance worthy of eating and causing them to grow. Because the shepherd is determined. They've got all they can get out of this place. It's time to go to a new place. And obviously we're talking metaphorically here, right? 
We're not talking about picking up and moving across town. We're not picking up and saying it's time to go to Michigan. We're talking about where we're at in that journey as a church. Because just as you and I grow as individuals and have this journey in life that God weaves us through and directs our steps, so does a church. Okay, so does a church. That's why every church is different. Every church is unique. Okay, because that church has been called to do something different. But when we think about this whole idea of change and new and different, it's scary. It's scary. We don't like that stuff. Why do I know? Because I'm 60 years old. That's how I know. And you are 10 and 12 and 15 and 20. Everything is new to you. Okay? It's the first time you're doing it. Do it for 60 years. And then... Then I have somebody ask you, hey, it's time to change. We're not going to do that anymore. What? What do you mean we're not going to do that anymore? They're working on our street just south of me where we live, and they've torn it up. Yes. Okay, right? Yes. All right. Yes. All right. They, ha- they didn't ask me. <laughs> they didn't say, hey, by the way, um, we know you um, get out of your driveway every day. You back out the same way, not looking and you go down the road, and you stop, and you turn left, rarely paying attention to what you're doing, um, that's going to change for a while. No, no, nobody, nobody asked me. Because I would have said, "Uh -uh. uh-uh, nope, this is not what I'm doing, right? So what's going to be different for us? That thing Brother Sonny's been telling us about, gathering, scattering, gathering, scattering, change, new, different. So, by the way, if you don't think we're preparing to move, grow, shift our focus, look at Brother Sonny's new message series. Starts next week. Okay. So he's been laying all the groundwork. He's been prepping the soil. He's going to start doing this now. Okay. He's going to start doing this. And what do we just say about that? It isn't going to feel good. So my question to all of us is knowing this, knowing that Brother Sonny is pushing us to focus maybe in a different place, something new, that the pastures we've had have been good for us when we've been there because it's caused us to grow, but now it's time to move on to something else. Where are you with that? Where are you with that whole feeling? Because it's something you might as well start thinking about, right? You just ought to start thinking about it. Here's your question. Are you ready to move where God is leading? And it's interesting because you have young people who will say, yeah, I'm ready to go because I really don't have any established patterns, so let's go. And you got uh, not so young people who are saying, wait a minute, what's wrong with the way we've been doing it? It's worked. It's worked. But those not-so-young people tend to forget that they once were young people. And there was another group of old people sitting over there when this group said it's time to change. And that's part of life. That's part of the cycle that we live in, right? So let me give you some practical suggestions for this great journey that I believe is ahead of us. Yes, I have a little more insight just because Brother Sonny and I have talked about this, but not much. Not much. I don't want much. Okay? That's his job, not mine. Okay? I learned a long time ago there can be one pastor and only one. Okay? Try to have more than one, you get into trouble. Amen. Doesn't work. Just doesn't work. So let me give you some, some what I think are some practical suggestions for a great journey. First, before we start, let me back up a minute. Let me say, join us. Okay? Because we're going to take this journey. Okay? We're going to go somewhere. We want you to believe, we want you to be baptized, and we want you to be added. So if you've done that, then let's talk a little bit about, again, where are you as a church member? Here's the the practical stuff. I'm going to encourage us all to engage. Here's some verses for you. God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Another verse. The whole body grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And then one more verse 
out of Thessalonians I threw in at the last minute. Those who do not work should not eat. <laughs> Just thought it was appropriate when I thought about it and put it in there. And that's a great principle in life, by the way, but that's not what this is talking about. This is not talking about should I eat food because I don't work manual labor. This talks about the fact that we get served up God's richest message and teaching that you could ever participate in. And this verse simply says, if you're enjoying the benefits of the table, then bring something to it. Then bring something to it. Whatever that is, whatever God's called you, because remember, God put all the pieces together, not me. I can't tell you what to bring to the table. Okay? That's God's business. That's between you and him. But there's a table, and he expects us to bring something to it so that we can share in that and that we can all grow together. God has placed every member in the body. The body grows when each church member does their work. Each church member should do their work to reap the benefit of belonging. Okay? So, engage and concentrate. What happens if you or the church says yes to every opportunity? Okay, this is where I'll tell Brother Sonny, ignore the next few words I'm going to say. We have a pastor that doesn't like to say no to us. Okay, so we have to help him regulate that a little bit. Okay, because see, he wants you, that first word, he wants you engaged. And so he says, whoo, you, you said something. You had an idea. Okay, run with it. Even though it may not be the thing to do, his goal is to engage you. His goal is to help you take that first step. I would encourage you, if you had that idea, to say, I don't know if this is the right thing to do, but I'm certainly interested in helping some way. Here was my thoughts. What do you think? And that gives him the opportunity to say, I love the fact that you want to work with our youth. Maybe that's not the best thing right now, but, man, we've got this need over here with our youth. We can really plug you into that thing as opposed to doing a new thing, okay, in addition to all of the opportunities. What happens if you say yes to every opportunity? What's, the, what's truly the end result of that in the real practical sense? Think about your own personal life. What's the end result of saying yes to everything? Ineffectiveness. Yeah, all those things that you said, right? Ineffectiveness, lack of focus, burnout, okay? Because why? You can't do everything. You can't. Nobody can. We're built to do everything. We're built for community. We were built to bring what we have to the table and participate with what somebody else brought to the table. Okay? I don't have to bring everything to the table. Let me ask you this question. Who should we be reaching? Who should we be considering? Who should be a part of our plan? Can we focus on all those who's? It's a hard answer, but the answer is no. We really have to think about our church focus and where it should go and what it should be. And that's not mine to choose. That's our pastors to lead us into. I'm just trying to give us a principle and help prepare a little bit of the pathway. That doesn't mean any of these groups shouldn't be thought of, included, and so forth. But where's our effort? Where's our energy when we come together? And we look at our purpose. Let me ask you this question. Did God heal everybody? Did Jesus heal everybody that he passed, he crossed paths with, that could have been healed? No. Why not? He could have done it. We couldn't. He could have. Why didn't he? He's trying to give us an example as to how to live. Right? When the disciples said, let's go over here, Jesus said, nope. But yeah, we got this big need over here. Nope. And he did something really strange. He went away by himself. And he prayed. And helped no one, apparently, except himself. Why? Because he was focused on doing the will of his Father. Not on doing what felt good, what gave him the most glory, what was convenient, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So God will lead us to the right groups. We don't need to pick is the good news. 
Okay? If we're paying attention, he will present those people that we're to minister to. So we don't have to answer that question is the great news. God will direct our paths and their paths in such a manner that it will become self-evident if we're paying attention. But that does mean when God is working in an area, he said, come join me over here. That means you're going to have to leave where you're at and you're going to have to come over here to this new place. And sometimes this is the bigger question. How? How? How do we minister? We've got these programs and they're really great and they're really good and I'm involved in this one and I'm a part of that one and I love to see those guys doing their thing. But how? How? But we can't sometimes answer the how until we know the who. And knowing the who helps us direct the how. Makes us decide which of these things, these activities, these programs, these ministries are the right ones that best match the who. And remember, we're changing pastures, not pastors. Right? We're changing pastures. We're changing the place we're going to grow. We're not staying here anymore. So if God is calling our pastor to move us to a new pasture, then that means some change is coming. And it means these kind of questions will be questions the church will have to deal with. Thirdly, this idea, or secondly still, concentrating. Just as a little thought I had. Saying yes to new opportunities requires us to say no to others. And we just don't like saying no. We just don't. Unless it's our kid and he's whining and so forth. That doesn't count. <laughs> Saying yes to new opportunities requires us to say no to others. So, my admonition, my practical advice, be prepared to say no to some activities, to some ministries, to some methods, to some preferences. Be prepared, because it may be your favorite thing. And we don't like that, right? Because that's the thing I did, and that's the thing I do, and that's the thing I'm a part of. But if we have a God who knows where we're going and a pastor who is following that leadership, then guess what he has for every member that makes up that body? A place. A place to contribute. Now, it may be a new place. It may be a new way. It may be a new how. It may be a new who. But God is the God of stability if he's the God of anything, okay? Even through the midst of him moving us from pasture to pasture, he wants stability. He built us to do the kinds of things he built us to do. Next, comply. I had a hard time picking a word here because I didn't want this one to come across wrong. Um, comply doesn't mean, this is the way we shall do it. That's not the kind of comply we're talking about here, all right? It's not the kind of comply we're talking about. But comply with God's direction and calling, okay, with what he's asking us to do. Remain pliable, okay? Remain pliable, like moldable clay in the hands of the potter. It's that kind of compliance that we all need to have. The willingness to say, you know, I know I've done this for the last five years, and yeah, I kind of like doing it, but God, I see where you're taking us. And I see that this thing over here that you have for us to do this could be way more effective than the thing I've been doing. And so I'm going to be moldable. And I'm going to let you lead me somewhere else. And I'm going to trust you that through this growth and this pain, this difficulty, that you're going to get the glory. Right? So I had Greg stick this little logo from our camp in there. Right? I just thought it was appropriate that it just kind of fits here. Right? He is greater than me. John 3.30 says what? He must increase and I must decrease, right? So if we have a pastor, and we do, who believes God wants us to go a certain direction, and he does, and he begins to lead us in that direction, and he will, then it's no longer about my will. It's no longer about what I want. It's no longer about what I think. It doesn't mean we don't have voices. That's not the point. But it means I need to get the I and put it behind the he. And let he speak 
instead of me. Act would be the last recommendation I'll give to you. Greg took it, so I'll hold it up. You see in my hand the, uh, the commitment form. You don't, you don't literally need it, but we'll all pretend it's there. Um, and if you look at it, you'll notice, those of you who've been around for a while, you'll notice it's different than in times past, right? And what do you see that's different than times past? It's shorter. It's shorter? Categorized. Categorized. Yeah, Brother Sonny has kind of grouped similar ministries, similar giftings, if you will. Teaching, for example, right? Hey, I really believe God's called me to teach. And I'm open and I'm pliable to wherever the church thinks my skills, talents, gifts can best be used. Not, I want the third and fourth graders on Sunday for the first quarter and the third quarter of the year. Isn't that kind of telling God what we're doing? So remember, God placed you here to do his will, not yours. Not mine, not Brother Sonny's. We're not here to do Brother Sonny's will. We're not here to do the deacon's will, the trustee's will. We're not here to do anybody's will but God's. And the beauty is, he's the head of the church. Jesus Christ, the head of the church. That's a great organizational structure to be in. You know why? I don't got to listen to anybody else. If I'm listening to what Jesus says to do, and I'm paying attention to the, the person in charge, and that's Jesus, and I do what he says to do, and he's telling everybody else what to do, and by the way, he happens to be perfect, how well do you think things will go? How well do you think things will go? They'll go great until one of us quits listening. Right? And that's called life. Right? That's just called life. And then we'll encourage one another and we'll help course correct and we'll get back on track and we'll keep going because that's just what life's all about. Because none of us are going to get it right all the time. We just won't. But the great news is I get the same message. I get a consistent message because if he's telling me to do one thing, he tells Sister Debbie to do something different, and he, and he tells Gage to do something yet different, those are all going to work together. I'm not going to have to worry about am I in conflict with anybody. He's got it straight. He's got it figured out. So here we go. Just the final thoughts. Engage, concentrate, comply, and act. That would be my encouragement to you. And be praying, obviously. Some of the stuff, hopefully I don't need to say, but I will say. Um, because our pastor is nervous about taking us to the next pasture. And if you don't know him well enough, you don't know that he's second-guessing himself and wondering, is this the next place to go? And God, is this really where you want? And oh, by the way, am I the right leader to take them there? All of those questions come into his mind. Right? And so my encouragement to him, along with some of the rest of the leaders, was if you know where God wants us to go, then let's get about it. Okay? We'll figure it out. We will figure it out. Because if it's really God leading you, then there's nothing to worry about. Right? Because we can have all the plans we want in the world. Proverbs, remember? But he's going to direct our next step. And then he'll direct the next one and the next one and the next one. So engage. We, we'd love you to be involved in this process. We would just love that. If you've not yet engaged in the process, we'd strongly encourage you to do so. Concentrate and begin ready to get your mind wrapped around concentrating. And a better word for focus and be, being prepared to say no to some things. Right? Compliance. Not compliance to rules, but compliance to God's will and be moldable. And then act. Do something. You can do all those other three things and not act. And you've not brought anything to the table. Okay? And this body needs everything that everybody has. Nobody is not important. Have you ever had fruit salad without whipped cream? <laughs> have you ever had fruit salad with whipped cream that didn't have sugar in it? All those things are horrible. (laughs) 
So we need the whipped cream for the fruit salad. We need the little cherry things that make no sense, but they're there. And we need to eat them because some reason that balances out the flavor. But if somebody didn't pick the cherries and put them in the can with all those other things that they put them in and do all the tasks, then we wouldn't get a good fruit salad. And that's kind of an analogy of what we are. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> We're just kind of like a bowl of varying pieces of fruit. You can be what you want to be. Some of you look kind of banana-ish. Some of you look kind of pineapple-ish. But alone, we're OK. Pretty good. But together, mixed by somebody who really knows how to make good fruit salad, we're wonderful. We're amazing together. We blend well. We satisfy others who taste us in the sense of hearing the message that God's delivered when it's done in harmony. So I'll leave you with Brother Sonny's thoughts, my version. We love you to gather together consistently for encouraging and equipping. That equipping includes that engaging and that, that focus and that compliance and that acting. And that's our motivation to go out, to serve others. And I love, I, I, I make fun of him, but I love this word, this enthusiastically. Because you've seen people who serve not so enthusiastically, right? But boy, if we could just serve enthusiastically, wouldn't people go, what's up with those folks? I don't understand them, but man, they're just, they're so much like Missy all the time. with unconditional love. Bow your heads and hearts. Father in heaven, thank you for the day. Thanks for letting me uh, come up here and just try to help in some way. Prepare our, our group, our people that you've blessed me to be a part of. Um, and Father, my hope is that this helps our pastor lead where he wants to go. He didn't ask me to say any of this, and he didn't tell me what to say, and I therefore hope it's the right stuff and that it doesn't undo his direction. Father, if those here can just see the compassion and the love that our pastor has for us and the desire to grow us in a manner that would be fitting to your service, that alone could motivate but much greater than that, we have what you did through your son, Jesus, and we're just so grateful for his sacrificial work and how many life examples we can take from him and understand how we can work together better, how we can strive together better, and how we can shift our focus from ourselves to our Father and love what he loves. And that's people, and especially those who don't know him yet. So help us, Father, in this community to broaden our vision, but narrow our focus as we share the gospel so that we may win some. Father, I'm just reminded of Christ and, and his ministry and how the most impact he had was one-on-one -on -one with the woman at the well, with the teacher, with the Pharisee, with the harlot. Yes, he spoke to thousands, and they awed and ooed, but there was more life-changing done one-on-one. -on -one. So I just pray, Father, that you help us see that it's all about just one-on-one -on -one with other people. It's not about what we do when we're here. This is that pep rally. It's that time we get to come together and just, yeah, thanks for all that you've done, God, and get excited about that and remember your goodness and then head back out to our one-on-ones with those people who we come in contact with. Help us live a life that's pleasing in front of them to you and points them to your son and would share the gospel in all of our mannerisms and our discussions and our actions. <laughs> Father, thank you for each one who's come out today and, and the tolerance of putting up with me and the opportunity just to, to love each other and, and share a little time together. We pray for our pastor um, as he returns to us and Sister Carrie, um, just continue to bless their ministries um, in such a mighty way. So difficult, Father, 
Um, we don't begin to understand, but we just see from afar the challenges of, of pastoring one of your flocks. Help us be good followers. Help him be a good follower um, because we know we've got the best leader that we could ever have. We ask these favors and these blessings and these things in your son's name. Amen.